Hey guys, what's going on? It's Mario once again with another live stream presentation here. This one called the Axis of Libra. So it's so funny. Um, it seems like every single year during Libra season, <laughs> I get incredibly busy. And so I've noticed over the last few years that my content for Libra typically is, um, you know, far less than every other sign. And I thought that was kind of interesting because um, I did just seem to just get projects and I seem to get tied up with all sorts of things. And this year I was like, okay, Libra season's around the corner. I'm going to like make these videos and presentations and posts and everything else. And uh, sure enough, I got tied up once again, but I was still behind the scenes researching and decoding things about Libra. And the information I was coming across uh, was really, really potent stuff. And I'm just like, I have to get this off my chest at some point. So I intended to do this like a week or two ago. Did not happen for various reasons. Uh, I was out of town and just, you know, tied up doing other things, uh, you know, behind the scenes here, work related stuff, design stuff, which is all beautiful and great, but I did not have time to do this presentation. So I know we're in Scorpio season, obviously, but I really, really wanted to talk about Libra. So here we are with the axis of Libra. I'm stoked to get into it with you all. Uh, if you're hanging out right now live, thanks for being here. And if you catch this after the fact, thank you for checking it out. I hope you guys get something out of this presentation. I feel like this has been years in the making, actually, because there's a lot of signs that I feel like I have a really good relationship with, if you will, and I can talk about for a very long time, and I have many sort of um, decoded sort of things that I've, you know, um, picked up over the years that I like to discuss and, you know, I've made videos about. But Libra seems to be a sign for me that took a little while to actually kind of uh, present itself to me. And so now, though, I'll say I feel like I have a much, much, much better and greater understanding of what this sign represents, the true nature of the scales, symbolically, esoterically, uh, what the scale even means. And uh, it's just one of these things where it took a while for this information to kind of, I think, rise to the top. And, uh, you know, I've obviously been doing a lot of other research as well. And uh, some of that stuff, as you guys might know, you know, related to the world axis, to the polar tradition, things like that. It really came into play this year. And I'm like, wow, a lot of my other research is really uh, becoming integrated with what I know about this sign. So... Really stoked to uh, just chat about it today. Um, I've picked up a handful of new followers over the last few weeks because of various shows that I've been on. Uh, if this is your first time catching me live or after the fact, welcome. Thanks for being here. If you guys aren't aware, I do have a website. It's symbolicstudies.com. So if you guys want to support, um, I have study packets available to download. I offer readings. I offer study sessions. Um, I'm really, really digging the study sessions I've been doing with people. And so huge shout out to all of those people who I meet with on a fairly regular basis or some of them on a very regular basis uh, to talk about symbolism. So if I can help you along your symbolic journey here and you're interested in uh, a private lesson, let me know. You can book a session on symbolicstudies.com. Also, shout out to my patrons, patreon.com slash symbolic studies. If you guys feel like supporting the channel, it goes a long way. Much love to all you guys. All right. Let's begin with the glyph for Libra here, right? So I've talked about this before, and most people's understanding of this glyph is that it represents a setting sun, right? Which makes perfect sense for Libra season. So Libra being uh, symbolic of our transition to the night side of the zodiac, uh, symbolic of a transition to the underworld, I would say. It makes sense that a setting sun um, would be the glyph that uh, is associated with this sign. So it has to do with balance, right? So, you know, at the beginning of fall, there are equal parts day and night. 
uh, Libra initiates the season of fall. And then uh, in the springtime, the spring equinox, there are equal parts day and night as well. So Libra and Aries, equal parts day and night. Uh, Libra is when obviously we're going to be consumed with more nighttime. There's going to be less sun. The uh, natural world is receding. And so the leaves are falling off of trees, you know, things of that sort. Even people are starting to go indoors. So having a sun that's kind of cut off because it's descending uh, over the horizon line, from, over the horizon line from our perspective, makes a lot of sense, right? So um, we're dealing with you know this symbolic, uh, mythological aspect of the sun. This idea that it dies every single night, right, and it's reborn every single morning. Um, and there's a lot to say too about literally the word set sunset and i've done some interviews and some presentations about set the egyptian deity and that's kind of aside the point here but there are things that can kind of be unpacked regarding set and the word sunset and so it's all about balance right with the scales and so half a sun implies balance the balance between daytime nighttime uh again i think about the balance between the day side of the zodiac and the night side of the zodiac and even the word balance there's a lot of esoteric things that we can talk about with that but i wanted to show this glyph because this really uh as with all of the signs you know the glyph of each sign says a lot a lot more than what people realize and so i wanted to start off just by showing the glyph and just talking about the sunset and this balance between day night black and white masculine and feminine also, I would say uh, the balance between the world or realm of the living and the realm of the dead, the underworld. And so Libra is the seventh sign. And the number seven really is such a huge number here. We have seven days of the week, seven colors of the rainbow. I've gone on and on about this stuff. But there's this idea or belief that is pretty ancient that it takes seven steps to get between this domain and the underworld and if you guys want to learn more about that i have a presentation called seven gates to the great beyond and i talk about libra symbolism a bit so it's no coincidence that libra is the seventh sign and there's a lot of material out there about these seven degrees seven scales seven spheres the seven traditional planets and this seven sort of tiered or stepped nature to get from here to the underworld, right? To the heavens. Um, and Libra has everything to do with the underworld, right? So it, it, it brings us into the underworld. Um, just like the sun symbolically is going to the underworld in this glyph, right? So again, balance. So let's talk about um, some tarot cards here and show you just some of the classic justice cards that are out there. So. In case you're unaware, justice is the card that corresponds with Libra, the scales. So what you're generally going to see is a woman holding scales in one hand and then holding a sword in the other hand. And the sword really, when you look into it, it's kind of a substitute symbol for the scales, actually, believe it or not. Because the scales represent this balance between two things, right? Day side, night side, black, white. I also uh, think it's appropriate to mention lunar symbolism and solar symbolism as well, uh, the feminine and the masculine. And what does the sword do? The sword cuts, the sword divides, right? So it'll take something that's one and split it into two. And there's even some tarot cards that really kind of maximize this sort of concept with the sword. So the sword divides. Right, So it takes the singular and divides it into two. And so in that way, I think it represents um, kind of a scale substitute in that it is this uh, thing that is uh, associated with balance too, actually, which we'll be getting into. But it has a nature to it that implies polarity or duality. And it's the thing that is actually severing the one and splitting it into two. Also... There's a line of mythology with goddesses and queens and things like that, 
where um, a woman is split in two symbolically, either graphically, visually, in an illustration, or literally split into like Tiamat, as an example, and we live within her, right? So Tiamat is the space that we live within, as above and uh, as below, as above, so below. And so she is split with the sword. Um, there is an idea of woman being split from the inside. This is actually related to some Scorpio stuff. This idea that um, the Scorpion mother is cut from the inside from her children who want to escape. This is something that you're going to see in a lot of symbolic reference books. And uh, it's not a real phenomenon, but it's something that's been passed down for a very, very long time. Um, even the nature of woman kind of being split, her genitals. Um, there's a few cards here where we'll see her legs are actually kind of split. When I say even, uh, you know, uh, the splits, you know, I tend to think of more of a woman doing the splits than a man. So this idea of nature uh, of woman, excuse me, being divided in half, that's a correspondence that has existed for a really long time. That's not the sort of focus of this presentation, but I, I just thought I would mention that. Also, I want to mention um, that bird in the lower right hand. Notice that it's on one foot and it's carrying a ball in its other foot. And so one-legged symbolism is something that we will get into here in a bit. But the fact that it's actually here on the Justice card makes perfect sense to me. And so this is the Montagna deck, by the way, if you've never seen it. Um, they don't use the traditional Major Arcana um, numbering system. So this is, what, 37 here? Um, you know, obviously, depending on the deck, it's usually the 8th card or the 11th card. Also, notice here that Justice, her feet are showing. The, the tips of her toes or her toes are actually being shown um, behind her robe. Um, and so this is something that we'll be getting into as well. It, it's such a little clue that her toes are poking out. Um, but it actually says a lot. So notice the, the feet symbolism going on here. So this is the Marseille version of the Justice card. Um, this is more classic and more typical because generally you're going to see justice in between two pillars. And so there you have it, the two columns or pillars uh, behind her. She has that sword. It's upright. Once again, the sword splits. It divides things into two. Notice that her legs here are kind of open, right? So this split sort of idea. And notice that one leg is painted, uh, or at least colored blue, and then the other one is red. So even with her legs, they're creating this sort of uh, split nature, this duality or polarity, not unlike the scales, right? That's weighing opposites. That's balancing these two sort of uh, concepts, this dual nature. Um, but yeah, you're going to see that this is fairly you know, common. This is the traditional sort of setup for the Justice card. You're not seeing her feet, though, you know. But that's okay. They don't all do that. A lot of them do, though. Right, so here's kind of a, a typical sort of uh, presentation of Lady Justice. Once again, holding those scales. Once again, with a sword. Um, I just think it makes a lot of sense that the person who supposedly hands out judgments is a woman as well, um, which I've talked about on other streams. Uh, but this is something that you'll see, you know, all over the Western world, this idea of justice being a female. It's not uncommon for her to have a blindfold on. Justice is blind. Um, but I want to focus on the scales during this presentation, the nature of the scales, how they work, um, literally how they actually function. And so you have the two pan, the ping from a horizontal beam, but that horizontal beam uh, wouldn't be able to operate without the vertical handle or the stand, without that vertical axis. And so here you see just a really, really simple image of a scale, right? And so whether the scales are on a stand or they're being held, the vertical axis is what allows this whole entire thing to function. So you guys can probably see where I'm going at with this, or at least some of you, right? If you've been following my work. And notice too, by the way, 
how much it looks like a cross, right? This is another thing that I find to be very, very interesting. So it looks a lot like a cross. And there are older depictions of the scales that look very, very cross-like. And so to me, I see a very clear sort of correspondence between the nature of the scale and then the nature of the cross. And I've gone over this in other presentations before, but my understanding of things is that the cross itself, the horizontal um, arm or beam of a cross came later and that the cross's original um, sort of framework or essence, its origin literally is with the standing stone. It's with that vertical axis, just one standing stone. Um, so before the cross, there was the standing stone. So the standing stone, which looks very similar to an obelisk, looks very similar to say a tower, something along these lines, that one vertical axis um, predates the cross that has that beam, uh, the horizontal arm of the cross. And so I'm just laying a foundation here uh, for some of the information that I'm going to get into here a bit later. But notice how cross-like the scales look. Well, it's really interesting. So when you look at a Kabbalistic tree of life, which I've discussed many times before, you'll know that the Kabbalistic tree here, that there are three pillars, right? Um, there's a central pillar and there's the two pillars on the side. The central pillar goes above and below the other two side pillars. So this is uh, the side pillars would be Boaz and Joaquin, right, in Freemasonry. Um, and you're going to see this all over the tarot, right, as well. So whether it's the high priestess card, um, there's hierophant cards where the hierophant is in between two pillars. You're going to see two pillars out in the distance in uh, a lot of moon cards. And as I just showed you guys, the justice card also has two pillars. So justice is actually in between those two pillars. So whenever you see two pillars, two trees, two mountains, um, two towers, there's always a middle way. There's always a, uh, a gateway of sorts. There's always a door in between. It's almost begging you to walk through it. Um, and this would be the third pillar. This would be, or the first pillar, depending on how you look at it, right? And so there are three pillars with the Kabbalistic tree. And I believe I have in my next slide, those three pillars highlighted, there you go. And so you have these three pillars. That middle pillar is very, very mystical. And I would say symbolically, it predates the other pillars. So you can't have two pillars without the one. And so the single pillar predates the twin pillars, right? And so this means that the central pillar really, to me, there's, there's a larger significance to the central pillar, which again, I've talked about many times before. Also on that central pillar there in, uh, in between Kether and Tephereth, there is a hidden Sephiroth named Doth, right? And it's been said that Doth has a major, major, uh, correspondence and symbolic connection to literally the word death and also Toth, Thoth, Thoth, uh, Mercury, Hermes, Mercury, Thoth. And so Hermes, Mercury, Thoth, uh, is a psychopomp. So he goes between realms via this central pillar, this main pillar, this middle pillar, the, the pillar, the true pillar of transcendence, which is related to the mystic pole tradition or related to the polar Northern tradition. But that hidden Sephiroth, Doth, is symbolic of the North. And so when you look into this material, that's what you're going to find, is that uh, occultists who work with the Tree of Life, they associate Doth with the North explicitly. And so to me, this central pillar is emblematic of the North, right? This world axis sort of concept between uh, the Northern portion of Earth and the northern sky, right? Between the North Pole and the Pole Star, Polaris, right? There's a pole symbolically that exists between these two points, one in the heavens in the northern sky, 
and then one on Earth. Um, so if this is the first time you're hearing me talk about this, I have a bunch of other videos and presentations where I really get into it, but I'm assuming if you've been around my channel for a little bit, you probably already know what I'm talking about and probably where I'm going at with everything. So in a way, this central pillar is outside of this two pillar system. And so it's not uncommon to see uh, Freemasonic tracing boards and alchemical works of art and things like that where the pillar on the left or the pillar on the right has a lunar symbol on top of it and the other one has a solar symbol so literally the moon and the sun you know on these two pillars and i'm going to show you some of these illustrations later on in the presentation but that central pillar the middle way or the middle path if you will is not lunar and it's not solar but it's polar because it's symbolic of the polar axis and it's symbolic of the polar tradition. What I've kind of been going on about lately, more so probably in other uh, interviews and on other channels and things like that, but um, it appears to me like there have been three major symbolic traditions that have in one way all existed at the same time, but in another way, it appears as though there is a clear recent tradition and a clear older tradition and we live currently in a very solarized world so we live in the solar tradition right now most people symbolically uh will decode things and are very quick to say it's all sun symbolism it seems that before the solar tradition there was a lunar tradition where everything revolved around the moon and the moon was the preeminent sort of timekeeper Previous to that, it seems as though the earliest tradition was a polar tradition or stellar tradition. And so they were more, people were more um, fixated on the fixed stars. So even astrology, which obviously I go on and on and on about, but astrology is a solar based system because we're talking about the signs along the ecliptic. And so it seems to me like in the modern heliocentric world, everything is solar based. But when you go further back, when people were more geocentric in nature, uh, geocentrically minded, um, they had a higher reverence for uh, the fixed stars, but in particular, the fixed stars that existed in the northern sky. So the pole star, the north star, and the stars surrounding it, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. This central pillar is symbolic of that tradition. And so in a way, all three of these pillars are related to the three symbolic traditions. And I'll show you again, artwork later on in the presentation that really drives this home. I mean, it becomes very clear once it's pointed out to you and you understand the symbolism, it's pretty obvious actually. So this central pillar though, in artwork uh, of old and in um, you know Kabbalistic traditions and stuff, uh, this central pillar is kind of the thing that balances the other pillars, right? And so to me, as I was thinking about this, and as I was reading some material about the scales and scale symbolism, I was like, holy shit, I'm like, this is related to Libra. I mean, this is Libra symbolism all day, in my opinion. And so I'll show you just a kind of a, a visual on what I'm talking about here. So again, a lunar pillar, a solar pillar, and then in the middle, you have a polar pillar. Right, So you can almost imagine that the central pillar is what balances the scales, right? Is what balances the lunar and the solar. And without this central pillar, there would be no balance between these other things. And so the central pillar predates the symbolism of what's in the pants. It predates the positive and the negative, and it predates the uh, solar and the lunar, the masculine, the feminine. It's beyond that because really the central pillar is very, very much symbolic of truly the one, you know, uh, the monad of God. It, it's a it's a primordial deity, you know, in a lot of ways. A lot of really old ancient primordial gods were associated with this central pillar, with a, a phallic sort of energy, um, with the polar tradition. And so it seems to me like solar symbolism and lunar symbolism as old and as ancient as they are especially from our human perspectives they're kind of a newer tier of god 
They are a newer tier of deity. The symbolism is newer, especially the solar tradition. Solar symbolism is newer, which is why in the sun card, what do you always see? You're going to see a child. You're going to see a young boy or you're going to see twins, right? Um, and so that's a, another interesting thing that I'm, I didn't include in here, but that the three symbolic traditions are encoded in the tarot. And it's an accurate depiction of these three, three traditions. So the sun card has a young boy, right? S-O-N, S-U-N, the sun. Uh, this is the most recent tradition. This is the modern tradition. But the sun is considered to be, in my opinion, for what it's worth, a newer god, a newer deity, not as old or as ancient as some other deities. So you have the sun card, the uh, 19th card, right, in the major arcana. And then before that, you have the moon card, which is a bit of a gateway, right? It's almost like the transition between uh, these three different traditions. And then previous to the moon card, uh, you have the star card. And what do you have? You have a woman who's nude preparing a ritual bath under the stars because it's related to the stellar tradition. It's related to the polar tradition. And it's not uncommon for her to have a seven pointed star in the sky, right? Seven points, Libra, the seventh sign, seven gates to the great beyond, all of these different ideas. And I think it's fascinating that right before the star card, you have the tower card, which is an obvious sort of correspondence here with the pillar, the single pillar, right? So there's an association literally with the star card and the tower card, they're right next to each other. So when we look at the sun card, we don't question what sun it is. It's our local sun, right? We don't question what the moon card is about. It's our moon. And, but with the star card, we question, well, what star is this? I'll tell you right now, my personal opinion, I've said this before, so it's old news, <laughs> but it's uh, the star of stars. It's the pole star. It's Polaris. Um, so the star card, symbolic of the stellar tradition or the polar tradition, the moon card, symbolic of the lunar tradition, and the sun card symbolic of the solar tradition and it appears as though it's gone in that order as well so stellar polar to lunar to solar and again they all kind of exist right now anyway but to me the predominant tradition it's very clear we live in a solarized world uh we live within a solar tradition which is why everyone attributes everything to the sun but there are older deities there's older gods than this Right. So there you go. There's that vertical axis that allows the scales to even function or work or allows the scales to even balance because there's a point of pivot on that pillar. There's something of an axle, right, that allows that arm to kind of teeter totter back and forth to get an accurate weight and measure for whatever it is you're weighing. So again, I, I mentioned it already, but the cross-like nature of the scales, right? So here you see Anubis. This is the weighing of the heart ritual. Um, and that cross is very deliberately there, in my opinion. Um, when I think about cross symbolism now, I think about crossing over. And so you have a cross, you have that vertical axis and that horizontal one. You have four quadrants, right? Uh, you think of a crossroad, right? There's four directions you can go in, but it's the middle of the crossroads or it's the middle of the cross that symbolizes transcendence. It symbolizes going to another place, which is why you're going to see crosses all over the place, you know, when you go to graveyards and stuff like that. And so you're going to see crosses galore. Um, but again, what predates the cross? Just vertical axis before there was a horizontal beam there. I have a book called uh, The Origins, I believe, of the Celtic Cross, and uh, the author really gets into this. And he explicitly says this as well, which I already you know, pretty much had a very strong hunch that this was the case. But um, this is you know, uh, information that isn't necessarily hidden, but you just have to look for it. Um, so I think it's really interesting that the central point of the cross represents the fifth point. Um, and if you want to know more about that, I did a show called The Pentagram, and the uh, the power um, of the number five is what I discussed. And a lot of the esoteric 
elements having to do with the number five is what that whole presentation was about. And so I think it's really interesting that Anubis is looking at the sort of axle point. Obviously, he's uh, taking the measurement, but he is looking at that axis point of the scales, right? So it's almost like he's looking into the abyss or it's almost like he's looking into uh, symbolically the portal to the underworld, right? Also, I have to mention that the cross being related uh, in its own way to Libra is very intriguing because opposite Libra is Aries. And so Aries symbolism has a lot to do with Christ, has a lot to do with this uh, sacrificial lamb concept. And Christ was crucified on what? A cross um, during when? Aries season, opposite Libra, right? And so there's a lot of sneaky cross symbolism with Libra that you can very easily kind of overlook or miss. Um, I brought up some of the symbolism to a friend online, and he also mentioned the fact that Christ was crucified um, with two other people, right? And so it's almost like he was the middle way, and these two other people uh, were symbolic of that duality or polarity that was being balanced um, with him being sort of in the middle. So I think that's all very interesting. But I needed to mention, or I wanted to mention this cross business here, because I think it's totally significant um, and is worth understanding. Right, so here is the Rider weight version of the Justice card. You see that they are, once again, in between these two pillars. It's basically saying that I am the middle axis, so I can accurately weigh the opposites and see which one is heavier, see which one is lighter. Uh, I can hand out judgments because I am neutral. I'm not biased. Um, and to me, that's a very, very powerful thing to kind of understand. And so they are the middle way in between the duality or polarity of these pillars, Boaz, Joaquin, masculine, feminine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the sword in and of itself is symbolic of this middle axis as well. And the sword is also a cross. You know, the handle of the sword uh, symbolically looks like a cross. And so at, in actuality, they're clearly showing you that uh, this whole card is all about pillar symbolism because you have the sword in the right hand right in front of the other pillar. And then you see that they're holding the uh, vertical axis of the scales in front of the other pillar. Because what they're really saying is these are both axis symbols. So we're getting into axial symbolism, right? And then it's really, really sneaky, but you see that foot creeping out <laughs> from behind uh, the robe there. So you see just once again, an acknowledgement of a, of a foot or the, uh, of a toe, right? And so this is also related to axial symbolism. So to me, when I look at this, I see clearly that the uh, left pillar is associated with that sword. The right pillar is also associated with that scale, but the scale really symbolically just in and of itself, it's the three different pillars uh, with that vertical axis being the handle. And then the toe also being another axial symbol, uh, which, you know, we're going to get into right now because I think it's worth unpacking. So there you go. Just a very uh, close up sort of scan of the card with that foot popping out and the scales on the right hand side. Here you see another um, justice card, right? That sword sticking right up there, the scales. Notice that the foot, once again, is being shown. What's up with this foot? I'll, I'll tell you what's up with that foot. Also notice that her legs are spread. That's very deliberate. That is not on accident. We're going to see other cards that do this. And for some reason, StreamYard always wigs out uh, and goes back and forth between <laughs> slides, even though I didn't ask it to. So uh, forgive me if that happens again. But this one-footed business or this uh, toe business... Uh, continues on here with the Crowley Thoth version of the card. And so you see here that she is balancing on her toes, right? That she has the sword 
pointed downward and her feet and the sword basically kind of are combined down below and she's balancing on this tip there and so this symbolism is super super powerful um and relates to uh the scales and adjustment beautifully and so here she is she is the vertical axis that's what she's saying i am the vertical axis which she very well is and she is balancing the scales right and she's balancing on her toes okay and so uh, once again balancing black and white all of these different sorts of ideas And so there you see it, just kind of a close-up version of that card there. Notice that her toes and the sword really come down to a kind of a fine point there. And notice, too, that Crowley and, and Lady Frida Harris, that they actually, um, they kind of mirrored this dynamic with those spheres down there. So you have these sharp points. They almost look like elongated upside down pyramids or something. But you have these sharp points balancing on these balls, right? Uh, the same way she's balancing the scales. Well, this is very interesting because Libra is ruled by Venus. So Venus uh, corresponds with two signs. So with Taurus and with Libra the same way Mercury corresponds with two signs in uh, Gemini and with Virgo. Uh, so Libra is very much related to the feminine, right? Because of this uh, Venusian connection. And what am I showing you here? This is a Venus figurine, uh, what it's been called. But essentially, these are goddess figurines of old, right? So notice how uh, bulby she is, right? Um, usually she's much larger in her thighs and her hips and her breasts, but notice her feet. So this is an ancient, ancient figurine, and these have been found all over the place. Variations on the theme. I'll show you a few more. Uh, but notice that her toes and her feet come down to a point. This is a tradition. This is something that has been done for a very, very long time. And it's very sneaky, symbolically, to me, what it actually represents. But once it's pointed out, I think um, you guys will understand what's going on here. So the, this feet, you know, the feet coming down to a point. You're going to see this in other versions of kind of a uh, Venus figurine. And so on the left, look how extreme that is on the left. It looks very primordial right it looks very very old very very ancient there's not a lot of distinct features yet you can tell it's a woman right and then in the middle same thing right very very um you know uh old looking it just you know there's not a lot of features to be discerned here but there's just enough detail to understand that this is actually a woman and then on the right hand side you have one that is a little bit more detailed but notice with all of them the feet come down to a point and the head also with a couple of them really look very pointy um, i didn't include it here but this reminds me very much of uh, the lingam or the shiva lingam that you'll see uh, all over india so really this is not that different from saying or from implying that the woman is the central axis she is a pillar on unto herself and uh, I think what's going on here on the uh, image on the right is that uh, it looks as though her feet were broken off. So I'm assuming that uh, if this were complete here, that you would actually see that her feet similarly go down to a point just like these other Venus figurines. So where else can we see this sort of dynamic and how can we kind of flesh out what this actually means? Well, you see it, you know, in the dancing world. So this is a ballerina. And, you know, what do they do? What's going on uh, with this sort of um, kind of performance? You know, what, what, what's, what's kind of typical or common to see? Uh, it's common to see dancers on their toes, spinning on their toes, like no big deal, you know. And so um, she is standing on her tippy toes. And so believe it or not, uh, having a woman on her toes or implying her toes, alluding to the toes, it all goes back to 
axial symbolism. It all goes back to the axis. It all goes back to spin, not unlike the axle of a wheel. And so that's what you'll see. You'll see ballerinas spinning around and they are basically um, alluding to the idea that they are the central axis or like the whirling dervishes, right? Same idea. Spin symbolism all goes back to the same spin and it's the spin of the heavens in my opinion so whether you're talking about the spinning of a wheel the spinning of a top the spinning of a, a mill um you know a pinwheel it all goes back to the same spin and it's the spinning of heaven right around what around the pole star okay and so to me that's become very clear over the years uh, unbeknownst to the people who participate in a lot of this stuff. So I would never expect a dancer to know that that's the deal, but that's the deal. Um, so here's just another image, um, right? So on her tippy toe, very, very feminine, not very masculine, right? And so uh, again, Lady Justice being the middle way, being this middle axis, the scales literally having this axle axis symbolism baked right into it well where else do you see this well here's one last example i believe <laughs> of a dancer but uh you know i was reminded of these music boxes right where you have a ballerina and she uh is spinning about right she is symbolically mimicking again whether she knows it or not she is symbolically mimicking the spinning of heaven and I spent a few minutes the other night actually watching ballerinas spin, and I was completely mesmerized. It, it was, it's such a beautiful thing to see and behold. You know, there's a reason why this is kind of a tradition. They're uh, symbolically um, encoding the spin of the heavens, uh, the spin of the uh, fixed stars of the circumpolar constellations going around the pole star, circumambulating the pole star. Right. So there's a deity, though, that you guys are probably more familiar with that actually encodes some of the same symbolism. And that is Hermes Mercury. I've gone over this before as well. And so Hermes Mercury, uh, it's not uncommon for him to be seen on one foot. Right. Um, he is heavily associated with the pole or the pillar or the post or the column. Um, and he's associated with spin as well. That's something that I've picked up over the last couple of years is that the spinning of the heavens is like baked into his symbolism. In fact, sometimes he's literally uh, spinning the earth with his feet um, or he's holding a gear which spins. So again, axle, uh, axial symbolism is at play. The caduceus, which he's holding in his left hand, is another axis symbol, another world axis symbol. Um, so our spines are a world axis symbol, not unlike uh, the caduceus and uh, the kundalini serpents, the fire serpents going up your spine. So Hermes, Mercury, Thoth, um, mercurial figures, they're psychopomps. So they go between realms. Um, so they go from the above to the below via this world axis, via this central pillar, via this transcendental gateway. That's partly what the caduceus represents. It represents the bridge between the above and the below. Um, I have a presentation called Decoding Chaos. If you guys want to learn more about world axis symbolism, that's a good one. And then uh, I'm going to plug another presentation later in case this is the first time you guys are seeing me kind of talk about this stuff. But uh, Hermes Mercury is a polar deity. A lot of deities that were related to the world axis or related to the pole became very solarized over time. I'm pretty convinced of that now. Um, I would even say Christ is one of these examples that Christ way back in the day was a more mercurial figure. Mercury is uh, associated with the divine androgyne. He's both masculine and feminine. So I said just now that the uh, tippy toe sort of thing is a very feminine thing. And here he is, you know, on his uh, on one foot and sometimes literally on like the tip of his toe. Um, and so this is his feminine sort of expression, but he embodies both. He embodies the black and the white, the positive, the negative. He goes between uh, 
you know, realities between the above and the below. So he is a synthesis or he uh, precedes, precedes, uh, he precedes uh, these two sort of ideas, these dual sort of concepts. And so uh, he is a unification of uh, of opposites in so many different ways. And so um, he is a polar deity, right? And so uh, I was saying with Christ, Christ seemed to be more mercurial, more of a polar sort of uh, deity who became very solarized over time. And so I think Christ now exclusively for most people is wholly a, uh, a sun god. That was not always the case. And so um, I think that's an interesting sort of thing to mention here. But the toe business relating to axial symbolism, that's what I wanted to say, which I have a slide for that axial symbolism. So the pole star, the pole star um, is sometimes called the nail star. I learned sometime earlier this year because it is the central point of pivot in the heavens. And so therefore it is related to an axis or a, a wheel spinning, right? So whether you're talking about the wheel, you're talking about all the things that I just mentioned, a hinge, I think a, a hinge is kind of similar to um, an axial symbolic kind of concept. Um, this idea of spin, anything that has a changeless center and things revolve around it, you know, is kind of like an axle in so many different ways. So axial symbolism to me has been something that I've really been geeking out on uh, as of late. Uh, because I see the power in it and I and because I understand now that your sort of um, decoding um, decoding symbolism with this sort of framework in mind um, really bears a lot of fruit. It, it is uh, such a game changer. It's been a huge, huge game changer for me. And so breaking out of the solar lunar paradigm and acknowledging that there is this older system, a polar northern system, has been absolutely huge and there's no going back anymore because I see it all over the place and I understand that this is a legitimate tradition that people revered for a very, very, very long time, unbeknownst to most modern people. Um, but it's interesting because there are a few correspondences that I came across um, that are substitutes for the scales. And so, when we see any constellation in the sky, right, um, that doesn't mean that what we understand it to be, Ursa Major is a really good example of this, actually. So Ursa Major, the seven stars of Ursa Major in the northern sky, um, we call them the dippers. So most people will look at them today and see vessels, right, a vessel with a handle, a little dipper uh, or a big dipper. Um, and that wasn't always the case. Their, their actual names are Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. And Ursa Major is the Great Bear. Ursa Minor is the Little Bear. Well, that's fine. Uh, in ancient Egypt, they refer to these constellations, or Ursa Major at least, as the thigh of a bull or the thigh of Set. Other cultures saw a plow. Other cultures saw a chariot. Other cultures saw reindeer. Some other cultures saw uh, sailors. So... There's been many correspondences to this exact same constellation, and it's no different um, anywhere else in the heavens, really, that all of the stars that we see and know, all of the constellations that we're familiar with, um, the chances are probably pretty good that different cultures around the world had different titles for them, had different names for them. And uh, Libra has had several different sort of expressions. So we know it to be the scales. But when you understand the alternative, um, you know, uh, titles or when you understand the alternative images that were associated with Libra, a few things become more clear. And uh, I think one of the amazing correspondences that I read uh, probably a month or two ago and I, I came across this in several different resources, but that uh, to some cultures, Libra wasn't a pair of scales or a pair of pans. Um, it was actually a potter's wheel of all things. And it's like, wow, that's really interesting. A potter's wheel. How does a potter's wheel work? Well, <laughs> you need something to spin. You need uh, the platter or the base, and you need for it to spin around a central axis so we're dealing with more axial symbolism here 
that is how you make a vase or that is how you make a pot or whatever it is you're creating a cup or something, you know, or a bowl, you know, when you look at a vase, right, as simple as it might be, um, it is encoding axial symbolism because it's the nature of the spin of the wheel, which is similar to the spinning of heaven, right? That you're able to actually create something that's uniform, that's balanced, right? Um, that is symmetrical as well. And of course, you're creating a vessel so you can put something within the vessel, but there is a sacred sort of or symbolic metaphorical center to these creations on a potter's wheel, right? And so uh, it reminds me of like a lathe too, right? So you need the spinning of a lathe to create a bat or something along these lines, but the bat is symmetrical and it's proportional and all these other things, but it's that spin that allows um, the creator to actually create uh, that object. So Libra, according to some cultures, was once known as a potter's wheel, axis symbolism, axial symbolism, having to do with spin, right? And also I just have to say, um, you know, you can be creating a vase or something, and if you, you know, use too much pressure or not enough pressure, uh, things can get completely thrown off and then you're out of balance. So the nature of spinning in and of itself, uh, there's a lot that can be said about balance with that and being thrown off balance. You know, this is uh, kind of related to the ballerina stuff I was talking about. It's like being able to perfectly spin on one foot on your toes is not easy, you know? And so it's it, uh, they make it look easy, actually, but it takes years and years and years of practice, right? And so, um, but the idea of spin is related to, to this idea of adjustment, which is what uh, Crowley called his justice card. Uh, adjustment. So if you're spinning, you know, uh, you might need to adjust, you know, your weight so that you're not going to fall over so that you're actually, you know, uh, in balance. So the potter's wheel, Libra, very, very interesting. The other thing I came across so many times was that once again, the scales, like the symbolic sister or, or brother to the scale is actually the sword itself. And when you look into older symbolic books uh, regarding sword symbolism, you will see that the sword is symbolic of the world axis. So most symbols that are vertical in nature, um, again, whether it be the obelisk or the standing stone, the tower, you know, uh, the wand, the scepter, um, they're all world axis symbols. That's the core of it. Um, that a lot of sort of, uh, ancient peoples, I think had an understanding of before the solarization of everything. And, uh, perhaps before the lunar tradition fully kicked in during the stellar polar tradition, uh, a lot of things were symbolic of this world axis. And this might just be hardwired within us too. Um, so I'm kind of open to different interpretations about what that all looks like. But the sword, in my opinion, makes a lot of sense that it's an axis symbol. Uh, once again, in the Thoth card, you see uh, the main figure balancing on that sword, basically saying as much, backing up what I'm saying here. But the sword, very, very strongly aligned with uh, with Libra. So here... It's interesting because Libra is the only sign that's not associated with a person or, or people and not associated with an animal. So we are, we are dealing with objects, inanimate objects, if you will. Obviously, the, the, the wheel spins, the potter's wheel spins, but you guys know what I mean. And so here we have these different objects that are corresponding with Libra, right? The scales, the potter's wheel, and the sword. There's a third thing that I came across that I think is very interesting that I think I first heard about a couple years ago. Another correspondence for Libra, and this comes from a, I believe it's a, a Christian source. So there's a lot of older Christian sky maps that have different symbolic interpretations for stars and different symbolic interpretations for uh, the various constellations. And I have not studied them that in depth 
but the sky maps that I have seen, very, very interesting, because if you're just interested in symbolism, it gives you kind of another wrinkle, or it gives you another way of looking at the constellation. And what I came across was that, according to some Christians back in the day, Libra wasn't the scales, but it was actually the Tower of Babel. So it was actually a tower, not, um, not a scale. And so that is very, very intriguing uh, for so many reasons. But just very quickly, tower symbolism, what's that about? It's very similar to building symbolism, um, but it's always ascension symbolism. It, it, to me, that is like the core sort of function behind it symbolically. And so when somebody builds something, um, they are kind of mirroring this idea of a bridge to the heavens. So you build a building and the person who has the most money gets to be at the very top of the building. And symbolically, I think that this kind of aligns them with the heavens, right? There's this ascension sort of idea that they are closer to God. Um, scaling a mountain, scaling a mountain, scales. Scaling a mountain is a very similar sort of thing. So as you go up the mountain, when you reach the summit or the peak of the mountain, you are symbolically closer to the heavens. You are symbolically closer to God. And so you feel more connected with the above, but you are on something that represents the bridge between the above and the below. And so the tree is a very similar symbol. So the tree has long been looked at as a bridge between uh, heaven and earth. The tower is the same thing. It's a bridge between heaven and earth. And that's what the Tower of Babel storyline is all about, is about all these people coming together to build this tower. Uh, God, according to mythology, did not like this uh, for a few different reasons. So their plan was thwarted. Um, but the tower is just another axial symbol, in my opinion. It's symbolic of the world axis. That's what it's all about. So... There were a lot of ancient cultures that had a sacred center to their region or a sacred center to their village. And they believed that that center was a point of transcendence, even if it's metaphorical or, or symbolic, so that their world tree, their family tree, was symbolic of um, their ancient past and of uh, you know the family members that had come before them. So they believed that there was a, a connection that this tree connected them to their history. And that's actually what a lot of axial symbols represent. It actually represents a stability. It's a reminder of a tradition. Uh, there's a structure, you know, there's an order that kind of comes with it. That's what the uh, world axis represents. It brought structure to chaos. So watch my Decoding Chaos presentation, and I really get into this, the, the, the real meaning behind, uh, behind order ab chaos, order out of chaos. It has to do with the world axis, and the tower is just another symbol of the world axis, um, symbolically being at the center of something. It's actually not uncommon, too, for people today still to literally build a tower in the middle of a town or to build uh, something that's very similar, you know, in the middle of their village or something along these lines. It's kind of like a watchtower sort of idea. But it's interesting that this uh, Christian uh, map said or showed that it's a tower, not scales, and specifically that it's the Tower of Babel because uh, most sort of uh, people's take on the Tower of Babel is that it's a seven tiered tower so that there's seven layers to the tower of babel very interesting here's the number seven again right seven steps seven gates to the great beyond uh the seventh sign of the zodiac libra which leads us to the underworld um the world axis leads you to the underworld you know a lot of um people have said that you know our souls ascend to the north upon death and I see very little distinction, personally, between the idea of heaven and the underworld. It's actually the same place. So this tower right here symbolically is connecting you to the heavens or literally to the underworld, right? And it's seven tiers, right? Seven main stories 
fits in line with a lot of other things that I mentioned in my Seven Gates to the Great Beyond presentation. Um, so I thought that was worth mentioning as well. So again, all of these ideas, the potter's wheel, right? Here's here's the spin, right? The spin of the heavens. And also, I just have to say that the idea of spin has really been inverted. Um, in the geocentric world, the understanding is that the heavens spin. In the heliocentric world, we spin. Personally, I think the heavens spin. I think that the earth is stationary. And I think it's incredibly stable. And I think it's going to outlast everything. You know, It's the most stable thing you'll ever come across in your life. And you're never going to experience anything beyond it here. Um, if you do, it's only going to be temporary. You're, you're going to come back here, you know? Um, so I'm talking about like astral projection and, you know, different ascension techniques and whatever we are bonded to the earth. Um, uh, but the idea of what's spinning, uh, has been something that's been debated for a very, very, very long time. What's actually spinning. I say it's the heavens above our head. That's what I think is spinning. So the potter's wheel symbolic of the heaven spinning, the ballerina symbolic of the heaven spinning. Um, the sword, you know, it's symbolic of the world axis. It's symbolic of the axle and the tower also symbolic of the axle as well. So it's almost obligatory at this point <laughs> that I include, uh, that past image, the last image, and then this image here, but, uh, just to show you guys, uh, right in the middle, you see Polaris, the pole star, and then I have highlighted uh, Ursa Minor, which is the Little Dipper, the Little Bear, and Ursa Major, which is the Big Dipper. And so these are circumpolar constellations. So they closely revolve around the pole star. They each have seven stars going along uh, with all this other septenary symbolism. Very, very powerful stuff. And I've mentioned it before, but I'm inclined to think that literally the shape of the number seven comes from Ursa Major. And so I, uh, yeah, I suggest you watch maybe uh, my North Star and Aquarius video uh, if you want to get into that. All right. So what does Ursa Major and Minor have to do with scale symbolism? Well, I will tell you, uh, this is from Jean Chevalier, and he wrote an incredible symbolic dictionary that later got turned into what's known as the penguin symbol the uh what is it the penguin symbols of dictionary no wait <laughs> the uh what is it called the dictionary of symbols by the penguin something along those lines it's somewhere around here but if you guys search his name actually i think i just found it there we go here it is so the dictionary of symbols but uh the complete title is The Penguin Dictionary of Symbols. And he actually, I'm just looking at it right now, he actually has Lady Justice right there on the cover, or at least uh, this edition does. Um, the reason why I love this book is because, one, it's cheap. It's so cheap. You can get it in a lot of places. It's readily available. It's not some obscure work that you have to pay a lot of money for, or you can only get the PDF. It's pretty chunky for what it is. And I'll say that the best part about this book is Gene Chevalier totally gets it. And he talks about the world axis when appropriate. He understands that this is the older, more ancient tradition that predates lunar and solar symbolism and, and solar worship. And so regarding the scales, this is for the entry that relates to scale symbolism. This isn't even a Libra entry. Um, but what he says here regarding scale symbolism is that when the pans are in balance at the equinoxes, the pointer on the scales or the sword, which is identical with it, becomes the symbol of the changeless center. The polar axis, which stands for it, points to the great bear, which in ancient China was called the jade scales. And so he's saying that in ancient China, literally Ursa Major and Minor were called the Jade Scales. This blew my mind when I first came across it. So here we have a direct connection between the northern sky, the circumpolar constellations, 
uh, of uh, Ursa Major and Minor being related to scale symbolism and that the world axis is exactly what I've been talking about this whole presentation. So moving on, he says, sometimes, however, the two pans of the celestial scales were represented by the great and little bear. Ritual texts of Chinese secret societies add that the scales in the city of willows are magnificent and shine like stars and constellations of which they are effectively the reflection at the foot of the cosmic axis. So once again, relating Ursa Major and Minor to the pans of this great scale uh, in the heavens, whose vertical axis is the world axis, a.k.a. the cosmic axis as well. Furthermore, the Sanskrit word for scales, Tula, is the same for that of uh, the Holy Land located in the north, that is at the pole. So the Sanskrit word for scales, Tula, is the same as that for the Holy Land located in the north, that is at the pole. Whoa. I mean, this is basically, I mean, to me, this just uh, says so, so much. He totally gets it. He totally understands. Uh, scale symbolism is world axis symbolism, is polar symbolism, is related to northern symbolism or the northern tradition, right? So the Holy Land, this is the thing that I think um, a lot of people are really starting to appreciate now, but that uh, the original Holy Land, the original Eden, the original paradise was located in the north and that there is a migration, whether it's physical, you know, and literal or, or perhaps symbolic, but there was a migration away from the north. And um, when we go back to our holy land, when we go back uh, to Mecca, if some people go to Mecca, when you go on a pilgrimage, that is to say, um, to your place of worship, you are symbolically going back to the north, to the original homeland, to your Arctic origin. It's a whole big thing, but I think you guys get the idea. So Jean Chevalier, to me, kind of like, really, this is like a home run sort of entry here. When I first read it, I know I read this at least one or two years ago, but it completely blew my mind. I know I've talked about it on other streams, but I don't know if I've talked about it explicitly in regards to Libra um, or not, but I think it's becoming clear, you know, what scale symbolism actually represents. Okay, so now, I mean, things have been interesting, but really, I feel like that quote and everything after gets even more interesting. Okay, so let's go over some Masonic tracing boards. So the ones I've been really digging into have been the ones that show three pillars. And... I have a presentation called Illuminati symbolism that really gets into this. And so it's not uncommon to see these tracing boards or Masonic illustrations with these three pillars. You'll notice that these three pillars oftentimes are marked with a sun or a moon glyph. Hey, <laughs> I cut out there, guys. So let me add the presentation again, and we'll get right to it. Uh, I know we were just getting into Freemasonic stuff, so let's see here. It looks like we're at slide 34. Thanks for hanging in there. Okay, so you'll notice that there are three pillars. Uh, the one on the left is um, symbolized with a sun up top, the one on the right, there's a moon up top. And there's this middle pillar. There's this third pillar, this central pillar. And what do you see? You see an eye and there's rays around the eye. Very, very interesting. Notice that the ladder, aka Jacob's ladder, which goes to the heavens, crosses over that central pillar. So I'll show you another example. Here's another one. 
So you see three different pillars. You see the one on the left is indicated with the sun. The one on the right is just below the moon. And then you see this other pillar in the middle, and there's a stairway to heaven uh, going to a seven-pointed star. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven points. There's the number seven again. Very, very interesting. So what's going on here? Uh, well, clearly, the pillar on the left is solar-based. The pillar on the right is lunar-based. Well, then, what's to be said about this central pillar? Well, it's polar-based. It is stellar-based, which is the same thing. So it, it's uh, it's alluding to the stellar or polar tradition. Also notice, this is something I recently just kind of picked up. Notice that the pillars um, go back that there's the sun pillar is up front and then just behind the sun pillar and in terms of distance from the viewer, there's the lunar pillar. And then behind that even further away is the stellar polar pillar. Uh, this is interesting because it lines up exactly with, with what I've been saying regarding the solar tradition being the most recent, the lunar tradition being older than the solar tradition, and then the polar stellar tradition being the most uh, ancient and oldest of them all. So this fits exactly with what I've been trying to say. So again, that first pillar, you can kind of look at it. It's the sun card. It's the child. The second pillar would be the moon card. The furthest pillar in the back would be the uh, star card, which again, sometimes has a seven pointed star and or has seven stars around that main star, right? And so let me see here, actually. I just want to make sure that I'm getting the order of things kind of correct. Okay, so before I move on to my next point, I uh, just wanted to say that if you guys want to learn more about this, check out my Illuminati symbolism presentation. I get into the all-seeing eye, and I talk about what it's really all about, and it's about the polar stellar tradition. It's about the oldest symbolic tradition on Earth, which makes a lot of sense that a secret society would, would revere um, this tradition because all of the other traditions are built upon it, right? Okay, so moving on. Here's another example, right? Same setup. You have three pillars, but that central pillar is more so related with that central star and that there is a ladder going to this central star. Let's just zoom in a little, a little bit. Okay, so... I see that as the North Star. This is the North Star. So this is the central star in the heavens. This is where Jacob's Ladder ascends to. Um, and there are Freemasonic illustrations where literally the central pillar and Jacob's Ladder go to the same place. And it's very clear that they're making it known that this is the North Star, right? Okay, so you maybe pick this up, perhaps not, but I'm going to point it out right now in case... Um, you didn't notice that this star is right below E as in East. So if I back up just a hair, you'll see that North is on the left. West is down below. South is on the right and East is above. And for a while, this actually eluded me. I'm like, what, why would this be East? If this is the North star, if this is Polaris, what is going on here? And this is kind of perhaps a side tangent, but I have to talk about this because it's so juicy. Well, now I know. I know what the deal is with, with uh, why it's labeled East. So here's another example. Very similar to what we've already seen, right? But notice that the uh, stairway to heaven, the true transcendent pillar being the middle pillar, goes to that, once again, seven-pointed star. Oh uh, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Guys, seven pointed stars aren't the easiest thing to illustrate. I just have to say. So whenever they're done, it's very, very deliberate. A five pointed star and a six pointed star or an eight pointed star are all easier to draw than a seven pointed star. So very, very deliberate, uh, very interesting symbolism, right? But once again, that stairway to heaven um going to the east and i also should recommend a book called i believe stairway to heaven by peter lavenda he gets into a lot of this stuff and he's saying what i'm saying so just cutting to the chase it's all northern polar symbolism basically and that that's the deep decode uh with a lot of uh 
uh, religious information or, um, you know, spiritual texts that talk about ascension or going to the afterlife or whatever. It all goes to the north. But yet here, it's indicated with east. What's up with that? Well, uh, very recently, I got to uh, meet a fellow named W.H. Mueller. He wrote a book called Polaria in the 90s. It blew my mind. I will absolutely do a video about this. And he recommended a book called The Man of Light. And it gets into this sort of idea of this East concept and what it actually truly means. And this is just one quote from this. So he talks about the Orient. So when we refer to the Orient, most everyone knows that that's a reference to the East, right? So the mystic Orient, right? Being related to this Eastward um, sort of origin of things. In his book, he starts off with, Henry Corbin does, he starts off with saying that the word Orient has to do with orientation and that the true orientation here on earth that you can't get oriented um, without knowing where North is. So your orientation here in this reality hinges upon knowing where North is. So isn't it interesting that our compasses point North? I've been saying this for a while, but the main star for sea navigation is the North Star. And if you understood uh, where other constellations are and you can um, you can find your location based on those stars, it's only because you know where they're at in relationship to the North Star. So no matter what, all of the fixed stars, um, it all depends on the North Star. So they all revolve around this central star. So orientation... Uh, is the true meaning and uh, the your northern orientation where north is um, on earth that that's what oriental actually means that's what the orient is all about so here just a very quick quote he says the orient sought by the mystic the orient that cannot be located on our maps is in the direction of the north beyond the north so this is like a hyperborean sort of concept so to me, this makes so much sense now on why in these uh, tracing boards, the true pillar of transcendence, the stairway to heaven is shown with an E because it's a reference to the Orient, but to secret societies, to mystics and things like that, the Orient isn't a physical place on earth it's not some place that can be located on a map like what this um uh quote says and suggests but it has to do with this what he refers to as a cosmic north sort of concept it actually has to do with more of a central sort of idea not literally going further east i think this is interesting too because uh when you look at a lot of eastern religions it's so polar guys it's just like in your face you know in my opinion so the swastika is like a polar symbol you know the mandala is a polar symbol the sri yantra is a polar symbol and so um even i was noticing the other day the flag of india you know it's a wheel it's a polar symbol it's all axial symbolism and so that i believe is what's being referenced here with this east it's a mystical east which is basically a reference to the north and this is just one little quote that i picked out from this book but he goes on and on and on about it so you might have to take my word for it unless you decide to read it yourself but orient the orient actually being a northern reference and when you get into it a lot of these people had this arctic origin northern uh sort of concept right so this is a uh, lodge a freemasonic lodge in london you will see that they have this large star in the center of uh, the ceiling here, this star they publicly acknowledge is the North Star. And there you see the ladder ascending to the North Star, right? So I find that all to be very, very intriguing. But uh, real quick, back to the uh, Kabbalistic tree, right? Once again, the middle pillar being the pillar of transcendence, the pillars on the side, being emblematic or oftentimes being represented with the sun and a moon that means that this central pillar means something else it's not lunar symbolism it's not solar symbolism it's something else it's polar symbolism so here you see another freemasonic illustration 
the pillar on the left having that sun, the pillar on the right having that moon, but there's always a third thing. There's an implied third pillar or first pillar that is more transcendental than the other pillars, and it's indicated with that eye. That eye, from what I gather, appears to be a reference to Polaris, the pole star. Also, I think it's interesting that what connects the two pillars is this rainbow, right? So the seven colors of the rainbow. And then you have that compass right there in the middle. The compass works because of that hinge up top. Kind of reminds me of an axle. Kind of reminds me of the uh, scales of Libra. So here you go. This is just kind of another sort of uh, setup. Same thing, pretty much simplified, but you get the idea. Solar, lunar, but in the middle, polar. In the middle, the middle way, the middle path, precedes these other pillars, precedes these other traditions. It's operating outside of the lunar polar sort of dialectic or duality, similar to Hermes, right? Okay, so there is a tarot card that I have in my collection that beautifully ties all of these concepts together, guys. It's incredible. And it's called Tarot of the Third Millennium. And here it is. This is the justice card for the Tarot of the Third Millennium. This illustrator's badass. I really need to know more about just his uh, other work, I suppose, and maybe some of his research or whatever. Because when I saw this recently, I was like, whoa, this just encapsulates everything that I'm trying to get across, really. So you have Lady Justice, notice her legs are kind of split, right? Deliberately so, right? This guy's like a master illustrator. Um, so she is sitting on this throne. She is in between the two pillars. She is holding that sword vertically. And that sword is the axis, is the vertical axis for the scales, right? The lunar and solar scales, which are resting upon the two pillars that I've been going on about. So I will zoom in here. And so there you go. So you have this two scales related to these pillars, but what actually makes the scale function is symbolically this central pillar, which is related to the world axis, which is related to the north, which is a substitute symbol for the scales anyway, which apparently this illustrator knew all of this stuff like years ago. <laughs> and so I think it's incredible. You'll also notice that the, uh, the sword, uh, the tip of the sword, uh, where the axle hinge is of the scales, that uh, that is making the shape of a keystone as well. So uh, the keystone is where it should be on the top of this arch, which relates to royal arch, Freemasonry, which is a whole nother thing. Um, but suffice it to say that that keystone and this arch is symbolic of the firmament, right? So of the vault of heaven. So um, the dome is the home. We live within a gigantic uh, dome-like structure, at least according to a lot of ancient peoples, uh, in this large sort of uh, toroidal bubble sort of structure, uh, kind of like an egg, cosmic egg sort of idea. But the top of the dome is north it is the center of this domain it's the center of the uh, wheel of heaven if you will and that uh, sword is pointing directly to that location in my opinion and so here i hope this card kind of ties in uh, all of these different ideas that i've kind of been uh, chewing on as of late um, so that's what i have for you guys that is the axis of libra uh, hopefully you guys got something out of this. Uh, it was really fun to put together and, uh, I needed to get this off my chest before I move on to other content or before I move on uh, to Scorpio. So if you're still here, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, if you guys are interested in bookings, uh, or offerings as in booking a tarot reading or a study session or uh, anything else that I have to offer, you guys can check out my site, symbolicstudies.com. I have a store that you can check out and browse my wares. Uh, so that would be awesome if you guys give that a go. 
Also, if you guys want to be a Patreon, a patron, excuse me, you can do so at patreon.com slash symbolic studies. Uh, you guys are awesome. And uh, honestly, every bit of support truly goes a long way. This is my elemental study packet. So uh, this is available on my site for five bucks. It's a digital download, lots of correspondence information here. If you want to know more about the elements, if you want to know more about astrology, uh, definitely check this out. Anyone who becomes a patron uh, gets this digital download for free, by the way. Also, Symbolic Studios. So I'm open for business. Um, I probably didn't mention it here, I don't think, but I've been a graphic designer for a good long while, a couple of decades, and I've designed all sorts of stuff for people. In fact, that is how I got interested in symbolism, is through graphic design. So that is my bread and butter. If you guys have a business or a project and you guys maybe need some help, with art direction or design, uh, hit me up and uh, perhaps we can work together. This is just one of my prints. Uh, this is Gemini. So I illustrated this guy here. It's silk screened. I signed them all. They all come with a physical study packet. They all come with a bookmark uh, and uh, some other goodies as well. So if you're interested in art, you guys can check that out. Notice too, I, I was very aware of the central pillar, the original pillar, the pillar of transcendence here. And uh, I included that poll, um, you know, for a very good reason. And so this also comes with a symbolic breakdown sheet. So I literally tell you all of the symbolism that I included, you know, within this artwork too, if you're so inclined. Snail mail, PO box 930 Carson, Washington 98610. If you guys are so inclined, uh, you guys can send me a letter or anything else for that matter at this address. Michelle'sHealingHome.com. Uh, that is my girl's website. So my fiance, Michelle, she has a podcast called The Healing Home and she interviews lots of interesting people. We also have a podcast that we do every week or two called Last Thursday. Um, and we just kind of hang out and talk to the chat, things like that. It's a good time. I give that a shot. She also makes uh, homemade remedies and she's very, very good at it. And she's been doing that for years and years. So deodorants and tinctures and oils, and uh, she's writing her first uh, book. It's a, it's a small book about uh, mugwort. That's going to be launched probably within the next month or so. And then uh, I know she just rolled some herbal cigarettes that she's about to launch and a couple of other things too. But if you sign up for her newsletter, that is the best way to uh, know what she's offering because she sends out a newsletter once every full moon. She has a new offering. And then she links to her blog and she links to different shows that she's done um, and all that kind of stuff. But you can find everything uh, about what she does at michelleshealinghome.com. So if, when you support her, you support me and vice versa. Also, uh, kind of a special announcement, but I'm actually teaching a, an in-person class um, later this month. And it's called Symbolism and Self. And I have a good friend. She runs a shop. It is a, an incredible shop. Uh, we have a history together and she's changed my life in so many different ways. Uh, she's been very supportive along my symbolic journey. Um, and I can't say enough good things about her or her shop, but I'm doing an in-person class on the 19th. If you guys are located in Oregon, you guys can check that out. Invokepdx.com is where you can find more information. Also, I mentioned it earlier, but you guys should check out Seven Gates to the Great Beyond. So if you want to learn more about some of the stuff that I mentioned today, um, I get into it in that presentation and uh, I relate it to Libra symbolism and things like that. So um, if you're unaware that that's out there, check it out. But with all of that said, guys, I think that's going to do it. I'm going to say hi to the chat. And then I'm going to get out of here. Uh, but this was really fun. And once again, hopefully uh, you guys found that worth your while. So who's here hanging out at this hour? <laughs> okay, right on. So Greta, thank you for being here. Uh, Eddie, hello. Thank you for hanging out. Uh, there, there she is, Michelle's Healing Home. Thank you, baby. <laughs> I'm glad you checked it out. Uh, Old World Micmac, what's up? Thanks for hanging uh annie ann what's up gareth uh i did not check the chat while i was doing all of this so uh my apologies but i just wanted to focus on the presentation oh what's up my sheree hello 
Uh, good luck at the DMV. Mr. E is here. KM is here. Um, let's see. I'm sure there's been other people. Oh, what's up, dude? The branch. The branch is here. That's good. That's always good news when the branch is around. Uh, Matt Moon, what's up? Uh, let's see. Uh, Pingu33. Hello, hello. And I think I lost some of the comments here, maybe, because uh, the screen, the screen, the stream glitched out. Sage of the Lotus. Uh, what's up, Lucas? Shout out to Lucas, LC King. Liam Anderson is here. Uh, what's up, Hank, Flat Earth Hippie? And uh, I think that's it. PK, what's good? Cool, guys. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I'm excited for Scorpio stuff, actually. So I'm going to get into that uh, as soon as possible. And that'll do it. All right, guys. Until next time, take care. Bye.